Good morning and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship Live. We're so glad you joined us this morning. We have a very good message, I think, for you, one that will be encouraging and warming to your heart, and we're so glad that you're with us today. Before we begin, I'd just like to say I'm Pastor Chilson, and um, we have this service uh, every Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, where we study the Bible together and present something from the Word of God. And then on Wednesday evenings, we have another live stream. Um, and that live stream is on at uh, 6.30 Wednesday evening, every Wednesday evening. And it's focused on prophecy and those things relative to the times in which we're living. Following that study, we have a Zoom meeting together where we can sit around the table, as it were, on Zoom, and discuss the things that we've talked about in the live stream, the Bible study, the prophecy study, and ask questions and get to know one another and basically have a discussion and fellowship time. And that would been be about 7.30 then, about an hour after we begin our live stream of the prophecy study. So I want to encourage you to be a part of those. If you have not given us your email, just send us an email. We will actually make sure that you get the links to all of these um, programs, these studies that we have on Saturday and during the week as well. And uh, we'd like for you to join us. Before we begin this morning, I'd like to pray. Father in heaven, today we thank you for Jesus, your son. Thank you for sending him to join our family and give us the opportunity of having a new life beyond this life and in a perfect land. Be with us today, Lord, send your spirit to us as we study your word and give us insights into things that perhaps we haven't thought about recently. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to study about heaven. When, when you think of heaven, what actually comes to mind for you? What is it that you think of when the word heaven and life in heaven is talked about? What are the images that come to your mind? If you were living back in the two to 300 uh, AD centuries, when paganism and Christianity were kind of blending together in a conglomerate, uh, really a rather mess of theology, uh, you might have had the idea that heaven was like this. Um, how about sitting on a cloud for eternity, playing a harp? Does that sound fun? I don't think so. And yet that's what many people believe then and probably some do today. That heaven is all about just sitting in some kind of ethereal spirit body, like an angel with a halo over your head, sitting on a cloud, playing a harp, and doing this for eternity. Wow, that doesn't sound interesting at all. Well, there are others who have talked about heaven, and, and perhaps your concept of heaven is a lot better than that. Uh, when I grew up, I thought heaven was kind of like going to a perfect land and being with Jesus and all the saints, but kind of having an eternity of worship and sitting before the throne and, and just basically being in a meeting in a church service all day. And that doesn't sound interesting to me either, even as a child, especially. And, uh, but since then, we, we know that heaven and the new earth in particular is going to have a lot of fun things. Kids like to hear about playing with the animals, uh, playing with a lion, um, you know, not being afraid of a bear, having them uh, walk along beside you and making them pets. This is one of the images that God gives us in, in his word in the Old Testament. And so today I, I want to suggest that for heaven, for me, or heaven for me, I think of 
fellowship. I think of being with Jesus. I think of being with the angels. I think of sitting down with my angel, perhaps, and letting him tell me my story with him at my side. Uh, some of the things that he has done to protect me through my lifetime. Some of the questions that I have had that I have never had answered, I want to be able to ask my angel or perhaps Jesus himself, because guess what? Jesus is gonna be there too. So um, there was a, a gentleman that I went to school with. He had actually worked in Hollywood as a cartoonist, as a caricature uh, expert. He did a lot of things for Hollywood and for uh, the public. He was quite an accomplished artist. And one day he met Jesus Christ. And he actually came to the school, the college, where I was going to college and took up theology. His name was Bill Gravesock. Perhaps some of you have heard his name, Bill Gravesock. I went to college with him. I didn't know him personally, but I saw him a number of times on campus and and um, I knew that he was uh, had kind of an interesting background in Hollywood. He was kind of a, a somebody special that you notice on campus because you know where they've been. Well, Bill Gravesock, <clears throat> when he graduated from college, went around to churches, uh, putting on programs for, especially for kids, but actually it was the adults that enjoyed it too. And one of, one of the presentations that he had was telling people what heaven was going to be like and making it more than just a boring place to be, a place that would be enjoyable, a place that you would want to go, a place where, uh, where you could enjoy having good times and fellowship and fun for kids. And so he had a presentation that he entitled Dancing on the Sea of Glass. Now there is a passage in the, the scriptures, Revelation chapter 15 too, and I'm gonna read that to you right now. And it says, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So that was kind of where he got his title, I think, dancing on the sea of glass. And he would act out. He was, he was a little bit like a Robin Williams as a Christian. And he would act out and, and uh, animate a lot of things that made kids laugh and enjoy, and adults as well, and think of heaven as a pleasant place, a fun place to be. Well, when you think of heaven, I, I, I would guess that that was probably the other extreme of what we've talked about before. Somewhere in the middle is where, what heaven is going to be like. But now I wanna ask you an, another question. Have you ever wondered what heaven would be like for Jesus. For Jesus. What is heaven going to be like for Jesus? Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 21 because I want to read a story and talk about a story today that to me tells me what heaven is going to be like, not only for us, but for Jesus. In John chapter 21, it's the very last chapter in the book of John, the Gospel of John. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. This story takes place after the resurrection, probably two or three weeks after the resurrection. And it says in verse 1, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, get these names, count the names of the disciples that were there. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. How many is that? Seven. Seven disciples were there. Now, 
I'm going to I'm going to suggest that we put that slide back up the the theme slide that shows the picture of this story. How many disciples do you see in that picture? <laughs> there were seven. And so this is the story. In verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going fishing with you also. So they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Zero. Nighttime was the best time to fish. Why? Because they used nets in those days, not hooks. They used nets in those days, and when it was dark, the fish weren't quite as easily, uh, they didn't see the nets as easily, and so fishermen would be able to kind of scoop up those fish in nets and pull them in. So they fished at night when it was dark. But when the morning had now come, who was on the shore? Jesus, it says. Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was him. Then Jesus called to them and said, Children, do you have any food? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who was that? Interesting that John always calls himself, as he writes in the book of John, that disciple that Jesus loved. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, or he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. Does that sound like Peter or what? Impulsive. And by the way, don't forget the last time that Peter was really interacting with Jesus personally prior to the crucifixion. He had probably in his heart some guilt, and he wanted to be with Jesus more than anything else. He wanted to be reconciled to him again. He plunged into the sea, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, which would be about, what, about 300 feet, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Wow. Jesus was making breakfast for them. Then Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish. They even counted them 153 large fish. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. But Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. And this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So you say to me, what does that have to do with heaven and what heaven is going to be like for Jesus? That picture that you saw on that slide this morning to me represents a miniature of what heaven is going to be like for Jesus. Think about it. Jesus loved his followers. I go back to the night before his death, and I, I have to keep going back to that night when Mary Magdalene poured a flask of perfume on Jesus' feet and then wiped it off his feet, dried his feet with her hair. Imagine this woman who was considered to be a rather loose woman in the town, in the city. She was wiping his feet with her hair, and she had poured this expensive perfume on his feet. 
it says that it was worth about 300 denarius. And how much is that? In the margin of my Bible, it says it was about a year's wages. So if you were to think about a year's wages today, I know some people make a lot of money every year, but there are a lot of people that don't make a lot of money. And I'm just going to shoot out there, let's say $30,000, okay, as kind of an average common person's wages. Could be $40,000, depending on what you're doing. Let's say $30,000. That perfume today would be worth $30,000. So Jesus was sitting around the table with a lot of people that night, one of whom was Judas, another was Simon the leper who had been healed by Jesus, and the other disciples. Martha was serving that night, and Mary was at the feet of Jesus. What was she doing? She was pouring out her love on Christ. And Jesus defended her against all these leaders, these important people that were sitting at the table. Simon was a Pharisee, and he, was, he mingled with the leaders of Israel. And he defended her against their criticism. Why? Because he loved her. She loved him. He loved her. And then, how about this? The Sunday morning of his resurrection, Jesus actually waited to go to his father until he met Mary at the tomb. Remember the words of Jesus when she finally sees that it's him and knows that it's him and she, she wants to just grab him and hug him probably or at least hold him in some manner, and what does he say? Do not detain me, for I have not yet been to my father. He waited for her before he went to his father. It had been, you think about it now, it had been 35 years since Jesus had been in heaven. He had been born in Bethlehem, had lived 30 years of life, and then he went into his three and a half years of ministry, ending with death, resurrection. He had not been yet to his father, and he waited for Mary before he went to heaven to present himself before the father. Why? Because Jesus loves sinners. Jesus loves people that are responsive to his love, and Jesus loved Mary. When you think about what Jesus was going to experience when he got back to heaven, there's actually a text in scripture in the Psalms that I'm going to read to you this morning that to me is a picture of what Jesus met when he went to the gates of heaven and entered in to see his father. This is the welcome that he got in Psalm 24. Psalm 24, I want to read this to you because this is what Jesus waited for before going in order that he might let Mary know that he had risen and ask her to tell his disciples, whom he loved too, that he was risen. Here, imagine, if you will, Jesus approaching the gates of heaven to meet his father. Imagine, if you will, choirs of angels. Choirs of angels there to welcome him back. I think of an experience I had when I was in college. I was part of a choir, and we did a Christmas program at the, um, at the church there in La Sierra. And the choir had two, actually two choirs. We had an echo choir that was up in the balcony. If any of you have ever been to the La Sierra uh, Church that is associated with La Sierra College, now called La Sierra University, uh, you'll remember that there was a big balcony in the back of the church, and then there's the stage in the front of the church. And we had two choirs. We had an echo choir. And I think of this story of the angels as having two choirs, echo choirs, because listen to what it says. 
One choir says, one choir sings these words, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And then just like the other choir sings, who is this King of glory? And the first choir sings, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And again, the cry is made, or the call is made from the other choir as they sing, Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Those angels could not wait to have their Lord return from earth. They couldn't wait. Heaven is about people, about fellowship. Heaven for Jesus is about being with the people that he loves, the people that he spent time with here on earth, the people that he has redeemed. Let's uh, continue in this story with uh, with Jesus and his disciples and Peter. Verse 15, Peter is in this group. Peter is there. And it says in verse 15 of John 21, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these, that is, these fish? He had been a career fisherman, right? And that was his life, fishing. And Jesus says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? So I want to talk about these wor this word love in reference to this story. Because when Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? He uses the word, the form of the word agape. Now agape is the word for love used more times in the New Testament than the other word with which Peter replied, phileo. Jesus said, do you love me? Do you agape or agapao me? And Peter said, you know that I love you, Lord. Yes, you know that I love you. And Peter used the more familiar term phileo. Now, let me tell you the difference between these two meanings of agape and phileo. Agape is the same word that Jesus uses when he says, love your enemies. It's a principle. It's something a little stiffer. It's something that has to do with the will it has to do with duty. It has to do with something less sweet, but nevertheless kind. So when Jesus says, love your enemies, he's not saying to us, the impossible. He's not saying, love them like they're your family. He's saying, love them as a person. Love them in a way that shows them respect. Love them in a manner in which they can sense that you are a Christian, extending to them graces that they perhaps don't deserve. And Jesus, when he said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? He used the form of the word agape. And Peter responded, yes, Lord. You know I love you, phileo, you know I love you. And that is a word that is translated love that has to do with the heart, not the head. It has to do with sentiment. It has to do with feeling. Peter, Peter is, Peter is loving Jesus more today than he did before his death. Peter loves him more today than he did before he denied him. On that night, as, they, as Jesus washed their feet, Jesus is loving his disciples. And Peter is edgy. He's 
Lord, don't do this to me. Never do this. You are too, you are too, um, too, you are the son of God. Why are you washing my feet? Don't do that. And Jesus said, I must wash your feet. This is what I was sent to do, to be a servant to you and to love you like this. And just hours later, Jesus would uh, hear the words of Peter denying him and give him that look from inside the judgment hall as he looked at Peter and Peter at Jesus. And it says, Peter went out and wept that night. Now they are on the, the sea, the, the beach of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has just fed them breakfast. Jesus has just approached Peter specifically and said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me in principle? Do you love me? It's kind of a distant, do you love me? And Peter's response is, Lord, I love you. I love you. And it goes on in verse 16. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me, agape, form of agape, agapeo? Do you love me? And, Jesus, and he said to him, Again, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Valeo, I love you. I love you with my heart. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Then a third time. Now we know all about that, right? Peter denied him three times. Jesus is now asking him three times if he loves him. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he may have had a smile on his face at this point because he's actually using the word phileo this time. Jesus says, do you really, really love me? And Peter said, it says, it says that Peter was grieved because he had asked him so many times, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Listen to me. When Jesus loves someone and they, because of their need, they know that they need his love, respond in love to him. Those are the ones that Jesus loves to be with. Jesus loved his disciples and they responded to him. Jesus loved, it says Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Do you remember the story of Lazarus' death and how Jesus is at their home just before he raises Lazarus from the dead? It says he wept. He wept. Why was he weeping? Because he was feeling the hearts of those that he loved mourning for the loss of their brother. Jesus feels with us. Jesus loves us that way. He wants us to love him that way. And those are the people he can't wait to be with in heaven. That's what heaven is going to be like for Jesus. We have a picture of, it's just an artist's conception of Jesus with the redeemed in heaven. This incredible reunion for Jesus with those that he loves, that's what heaven is gonna be like for him and so also for us. Those he was with on earth, those that he has redeemed, beginning with Adam, can you imagine what it's gonna be like to see Jesus and Adam reunite in heaven? Remember a sermon that a pastor by the name of Morris Benden gave entitled, when Adam meets Adam, because Paul makes Jesus the second Adam, the one who comes as the second head of our race in which we are embodied. Just as we were part of Adam, we are now part of Jesus by faith. And what Adam did affected our future, our destiny. What Jesus did as the second Adam now determines our destiny an eternal destiny of, of, of salvation and eternal life in a place that is beautiful. And it's going to be so wonderful to see him finally face to face, but it's going to be also wonderful to watch him as he connects with Adam again, with 
Of course, Moses and Elijah are already there, and Enoch is already there. They, those are three individuals that walked with Christ on earth, walked with him in Old Testament times, and met him. Jesus met Moses and Elijah there on the Mount of Transfiguration just before his death. He's been with them. But how about the others, the prophets? How about David, who the Bible says is still in his grave? It says so in Acts. David is still in his grave. How about David, who is a man after God's own heart, and Jesus seeing one another? It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be heaven. Heaven is about being together with Jesus and the redeemed. You know, prayer is a wonderful thing. When we talk to God and wait for him to respond through his spirit to our hearts, it's a wonderful thing to commune with God through prayer. But just like I'm talking to you this morning, I can't see your faces. I can't see your faces. And on Wednesday night, when we do Zoom meetings together, I can see your faces, but we're still not together. It's not the same as being face to face, the little mini visions and imaginations we have of what heaven is going to be like. Listen, nothing like the real thing is going to be good enough for Jesus and nothing like the real thing is going to be good enough for us. I can't wait to be there. How about you? And do you know that Jesus can't wait to see your face face to face and to see the expression on your face when you see him for the first time. Do you know he can't wait for that? That's what he did all this for. Jesus, some of Jesus' last words to his apostles were, don't be troubled. You know, we're going through, this is the Thursday night before his death. We're going through a very difficult time tonight. I'm going to be crucified. He gave them plenty of warning. You know, this is going to be, this is my body which is offered for you. This is my blood which is spilled for you. I mean, the communion service on Thursday night. And Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. Why? Because, he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, which I am just said I'm going to, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be where I am. That's what Jesus promised he would do. There's even a text in Isaiah chapter 53 that says that when Jesus was able to see the fruit of his labor, the sacrifice that he was to make, he was satisfied to go through. It was okay. He was willing to go through anything he needed to go through to see the fruit of his labor. It says he was satisfied. When he saw the fruit of his labor, he was satisfied. I can't wait for that day when Jesus comes. First Thessalonians, Paul says in First Thessalonians 4, that he will come with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead will come forth from their graves, and we who are alive will join them in the heavens to be with him forever. There is, this is a, heaven is a reunion of people who love one another. I just happened to see, and I hope Sammy won't be feeling funny about this, but I found in the back of my Bible a little heart the other day. When I think of 1 Thessalonians 4, where Paul talks about us, Ascending into the skies with those who have been redeemed, the, the ones who have risen from the dead. This little heart she made for me on Valentine's Day of 2004, which was a hard year for us, the troubles that we went through, very difficult year. And this was February 14, 2004. She says, love your Sammy. And what does it say? Let's meet Jesus holding hands. I love you for that, Sammy, and I will be holding your hand for sure when we go into those clouds and meet Jesus in the air. And finally, 
There's a text that I want to read from Revelation. Jesus is our husband. He likens himself to the husband of the church, which is his bride. In Ephesians 5, he talks about husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. And when you get married, it says, you know, when you, you may, uh, have the union of marriage, husbands and wives will be one flesh. But then Paul switches all of a sudden. He says, I'm not talking about husbands and wives. I'm talking about Christ and the church. He says, this is about Jesus and his church. They are one flesh. They are bound together like one flesh. And then in Revelation chapter 19, we have a picture of a wedding feast. Jesus united with his bride. He says, it says in Revelation, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And then in verse nine, it says, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. That's what heaven is about. It's about being together with Jesus, about being together with those we love, those he has loved, and those who have been redeemed from the ages. And Jesus can't wait to see your face. He can't wait. I want you to be there. I want to be there with you. And I pray for that this morning. Father in heaven, thank you for loving us like you do. Thank you for giving yourself as you did that we might live with you forever and with one another in a land that has no evil, no tears, no crying, no sickness, no pain, nothing but wonderful fellowship. And yes, the animals, yes, that will be so much fun to be with the animals. And yes, traveling through space, yes, all of that too. Building a brand new home on the new earth, yes. Planting a vineyard, yes, all of those things. But more than anything, seeing your face and seeing the look on your face when you see us. Hasten that day, I pray. In Jesus' name.